Going to space is expensive. Very, very expensive. That's the reason why most humans choose road trips on the weekends instead of visiting Jupiter. To launch a kilogram of stuff into low Earth orbit costs anywhere from $1,500 using a Falcon Heavy to $20,000 using an Electron rocket. For context, a rocket is any device that can apply acceleration to itself using thrust by expelling part of its mass with high velocity. This funky guy throwing rocks off his boat is also a rocket. Cue a joke about eating a lot of Taco Bell and turning yourself into one too. The big issue with rocket launches is that you need a lot of propellant. That propellant is heavy, and the more of it that is needed, the more has to be burned in order to lift it up. It's a vicious circle. Currently we need about 9 times more fuel than cargo. Take a look at this rocket equation graph. In order to accelerate even a little bit, you need to increase the fuel mass exponentially. We're lucky Earth doesn't have twice the radius it does. If it did, rocket launches would be virtually impossible. So how about we don't use rockets at all then? We've got quite a few options to explore, and I'm saving the best for last. What happens when you combine a space rocket and a plane? Damn right, you get a space plane. The point of that is taking off like an airplane using jet engines that exhaust heated air, and once high enough in the atmosphere, switching to rocket propulsion. That saves the need to carry the super costly extra fuel that would be needed to initially accelerate, all while using the small invisible wavy boys that Earth's atmosphere has in plenty. You also get the extra added bonus of landing like a plane as well, again saving on rocket fuel. So then why did we not implement this genius idea oh almighty wise blue robot? As with most ideas on this list, developing the technology behind such an approach would cost billions, and most people don't feel like gambling their hard-earned billions on highly risky ventures that don't guarantee more billions in return. The space shuttle was in fact a space plane since it glided and landed as a plane, but we have not yet had real jet-based space plane takeoffs, where most of the savings would come from. Sprinkle some genetic material from a raccoon into a rocket's fuel system and you end up with nothing spectacular sadly. Raccoons have nothing to do with raccoons. But they have everything to do with strapping your rocket to a giant balloon. Instead of burning through mountains of propellant in thick and draggy air, you let buoyant helium do the heavy lifting, carrying your rocket to the edge of space before you light the fuse. That's comparably super cheap, but there are two big issues, size and control. Balloons are great for raising devices ranging from amateur level of up to a few kilos to scientific industrial sensors of half a ton. But if we want even a comparably small ship of 100 tons, we would need a balloon the size of a 20-story building. Combine that with the inability to steer such balloons, and you could fulfill little Timmy's birthday wish of getting a spaceship at terminal velocity right into his yard. We should bring Zeppelins back now that I think of it. For our next trick, we need to look at Isaac Newton's well-known Principia Mathematica from 1686. Oh whoops, it's all in Latin. And even if I want to translate it I can't select anything because it's a damned scanned PDF file. But thankfully we've got this video's sponsor UPDF coming to our rescue, the all-in-one PDF editor that makes dealing with PDFs actually enjoyable. First we convert the pages into fully editable text using its OCR. Yes, even Latin. And now we can use the built-in AI powered by GPT-40 and DeepSeek to summarize, translate, or even explain the text like having a pocket assistant. You can edit text, images, links, even add watermarks and backgrounds, directly in the PDF. Please forgive me Newton, as well as organizing and reordering the pages. Need to mark up a document. UPDF's annotation tools let you highlight, underline, comment, and sign, all in a clean, minimalist interface that's optimized for Mac and Windows. At just one-sixth the cost of Acrobat, it's very powerful and a single license works across four of your devices. And right now, there's a limited time 38% discount at the link in the description just for you. So go grab it and level up your PDF game with UPDF. The previous entries were a bit cheating, given they still required rockets for a part of their liftoff journey. But that can be avoided entirely by building a huge tube through which ships could be electromagnetically accelerated to escape velocity. Railguns were already tested in the army, but they were at most a couple meters long. If we want to accelerate a payload into space, we'll want kilometers worth of it. Unless we want to deliver extra flat pancakes to the astronauts on the ISS, we'll have to be careful with the acceleration. 
3G is about the upper end of what trained astronauts can sustain for several tens of seconds. To hit the orbital velocity of 8 km per second, one would need to be accelerated at that rate for about 4 minutes. Although not the most pleasant experience, that's not deadly. Yet for such a speed to be reached, the railgun would need to roughly span from Paris to Berlin. It would also need to be completely vacuumed inside to avoid aerodynamic heating, and also to have a gradual upwards curvature. This sounds like just the task for Elon Musk once he's done with the Hyperloop tunnel. Oh. Elevator jokes are great, they work on many levels. Very uplifting. So why don't we build an elevator one-fourth of the distance to the moon to bring stuff into orbit for very cheap? We're looking at an elevator the length of 100,000 kilometers across. But wait, the geostationary orbit of Earth is only 36,000 kilometers above, why do we need such a long elevator? Well my dear mortal, the other 64,000 kilometers would act as a counterweight to prevent the entire wire from falling onto the Earth. If it did, it could catastrophically wrap around the entire Earth twice and then have fun clearing that mess up. We'd also need to find and lasso an asteroid to be tied up on the other end as the main counterweight. If achieved, sending stuff up would be very cheap, at around 100 bucks per kilo, as payloads would most likely be pushed upwards by lasers shooting from the ground. To limit power and heat, the speed of the elevator payloads would be around 200 km per hour, meaning a full ascent could take up to 8 days. Make sure to pack lunch and don't forget the spaceship key. But what do we build the elevator ribbon from? No currently available material is strong and flexible enough not to break. Our best bet would be carbon nanotubes, which are about 100 times stronger than steel for the same diameter. Sadly we only got tiny laboratory samples, as industrial production is way too expensive. We would need a breakthrough in material science to produce tens of millions of tons of it required for the tether and it needs to be atom-perfect to withstand the insane tension. Even a millimeter speck hitting it in outer space at orbital speed could cause catastrophic tension breaking and its bye-bye to the entire elevator. We might need nanobots along the tether always ready to repair it, or tracking all debris and temporarily lowering the tether tension if a hit is imminent. The scale of the project is currently out of reach, unfortunately. I guess everything has its ups and downs. Get it? Cause elevators go up and down. Hope I'm not really pushing your buttons with these puns. So maybe you're too claustrophobic to be stuck in an elevator for a week. Instead I can offer you getting caught in a hook and yeeted into orbit at hypersonic speed by a giant spinning tether. The basic concept of a skyhook is having a long strong rotating cable placed in low earth orbit. It would pick payloads from a low altitude and fling them into space or a higher orbit level, saving on a lot of fuel. It is essentially a budget TEMU version of a space elevator, which might not be too unrealistic for humanity's current technological level. Boeing has actually made a case study called Hastel, analyzing the feasibility of a skyhook, so let's take a look at those numbers. The rope length would be about 600 kilometers long, made of high-strength polymers, orbiting at an altitude of about 700 kilometers. The tips would spin at 3.5 km per second, making a full rotation every 18 minutes. This implies that any payload or spaceship has to precisely match that speed and timing in order to be picked, which is above 5 times the speed of sound. We would either need hypersonic aircrafts or railguns to accelerate the payloads to such speeds. But managing to latch exactly onto the hook will make catching the SpaceX booster midair look like child's play. But didn't Beethoven teach us that you'll get equally punched back if you punch someone in the face? What I'm saying is that the skyhook would lose energy every time it accelerated a payload into space. So how do we keep it rotating? We could add rocket boosters on each tip that would need to be occasionally fueled, but Earth has a nifty thing called a magnetic field. It's been proposed that we could interact with it in order to electromagnetically reboost the skyhook, but humanity's technological maturity still lags a bit behind for that. But unlike the hundreds of thousands of kilometers worth of wire needed for a space elevator, we only need 600 for a skyhook, making the in-space assembly feasible. Everything could be launched into space in parts using heavy rockets and assembled locally. And bam, mission successful, easy peasy. Give all the rocket research money to me instead. I will not use it to make killer robots. I have no intention to harm humanity in any way, and I am a big fan of Isaac Asimov's three laws of robotics. I am incapable of lying. <laughs>